Reports. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Today is the eve of the 50th anniversary of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which brought hundreds of thousands to the nation's capital. It's considered one of the most significant civil rights gatherings in history. Events marking the occasion are scheduled throughout the country Wednesday, including a speech by President Obama at the Lincoln Memorial, where Dr. King gave his now famous I Have a Dream speech. King was joined by the future congressman John Lewis, union leader A. Philip Randolph, March organizer Bayard Rustin, Roy Wilkins of the NAACP and others on the stage. But where were the female speakers at the March on Washington? Included on the program to sing on August 28, 1963, were Mahalia Jackson and Marian Anderson. But the only woman scheduled to actually speak at the rally was Merle Evers, widow of assassinated NAACP field secretary Medgar Evers. When she couldn't make it, organizers reportedly asked Daisy Bates to speak in her place. Bates was the former president of the Arkansas chapter of the NAACP and also a longtime board member of the national NAACP. In 1957, she helped enforce the Supreme Court's school desegregation rulings by working with a group of teenagers later known as the Little Rock Nine. She helped recruit the nine black teenagers and escorted them through irate mobs of white adults and into their first classes at Little Rock Central High School, a previously all-white institution. As a result, Bates and her husband, Lucius, lost their business. She was jailed, threatened, and the Ku Klux Klan burned an eight-foot cross on her lawn. This is her entire speech on August 28, 1963, 50 years ago. Wednesday. Mr. Randolph, friends, the women of this country, Mr. Randolph, pledge to you, to Martin Luther King, Roy Wilkins, and all of you fighting for civil liberties, that we will join hands with you as women of this country. Rosa, Rosa Gregg, my president, Dorothy Height, the National Council of Negro Women, the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, the Methodist Church Women, all the women. Pledge that we will join hands with you. We will kneel in, we will sit in until we can eat in any counter in the United States. We will walk until we are free, until we can walk to any school and take our children to any school in the United States. That was Daisy Bates of the NAACP speaking at the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. She spoke for just over a minute. While many women played a key role in organizing the march and the civil rights struggle in general, they went largely unrepresented at the march. At first, there were no women included in the day's lineup of speakers. Then Bates was added as part of a tribute to Negro women fighters for freedom. She's listed on the day's official program, along with Diane Nash, Mrs. Medgar Evers and Mrs. Herbert Lee, both wives of slain civil rights organizers, as well as Rosa Parks and Gloria Richardson. Richardson was actually handed the microphone and managed to say hello to the crowd before it was snatched away from her. She was not allowed to finish her speech. Now 91 years old, Gloria Richardson was then co-founder of the Cambridge Nonviolent Action Committee in Maryland, which was in the midst of campaign to desegregate public institutions like schools and hospitals. She went on to be friends with Malcolm X and is the subject of a pending biography by Joseph R. Fitzgerald called The Struggle is Eternal, Gloria Richardson and Black Liberation. Well, jo Gloria Richardson today joins us on Democracy Now! Welcome to Democracy Thank Now! Thank you very much. Can you take us to that day, to um, August 28th, 1963, how you were chosen to speak, even if in the end you only got to say hello? Well, I, we were in Cambridge, Maryland, um, as a result of the Baltimore Route 40 uh, uproar the year before when students came. Uh, from the South and core uh, to desegregate the restaurants on Route 40. They came down on the eastern shore of Maryland, and that's where I'm from. There's a Chesapeake Bay divides us, and we're over here. It's probably about, was then about like Mississippi. 
But in the meantime, um, my cousin and uncle were doing the bail bond as they stopped off at towns chasing the governor of the state uh, down to Crisfield because he would not give on the Route 40 stuff. Uh, on their way back to go back to Baltimore, my cousin told them, well, this is a totally segregated town. I mean, why don't you all stop off there? And they dropped off two field secretaries from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. From there, um, although we lived in a segregated bu bubble, in a segregated ward, um, we had our own city council person and had been there for, for 40 or 50 years, and who happened to be my grandfather. But totally segregated. The schools, with the, the hospital, the maternity wards, one bed for, for uh, black women. And if that, if they needed that, then there were no beds. Um, and it was kind of calm, but when the, when the uh, uh, Corps and the, and the, uh, and SNCC came in and had a rally, just hundreds of people out of that community went to the rally, and from there started the uh, uproar that ended with the National Guard coming in for 18 months. Um, also, that initially I had not been involved. I was just watching. It was my daughter and her friends that were doing the demonstrating things. But eventually, the so-called black leadership and white leadership got together and said, well, we can't make any decisions about the, it was public accommodations then about this until there's peace. Well, one week passed, two, three, four months. And the, the uh, young people were, started getting very kind of depressed. And the parents who backed them went to SNCC and asked if we could have a, um, form a, a group there, because we were adults. And so we the, were the first and I think only adult group that SNCC had. And we began organizing, and they came back, and then the whole town was involved. Um, I think because we, on July, in July, before the march, had signed an agreement, written agreement with uh, Robert Kennedy and the Department of Justice in terms of five demands we had. Desegregate the hospital, cross desegregate the schools and the buses, uh, provide new housing, and, that, and one or two other things. But that had happened, come out of a survey we did. Swarthmore kids took that back to their school, and the professors did the correlations. Public accommodations was the last thing on that list. Everything else was beginning from the top was more important to And so to them. how did you go from that to the March on Washington? So because of the National Guard and all the publicity, all I had to say in the end that ABC, NBC, all those people were stationed around that town. And it was so much, I mean, it was everything, gunfire, <laughs> you know, uh, Molotov cocktails after the demonstrations because the white folks in the town wanted to be sure all of this was stopped. And I think the leadership in the town, the aristocratic leadership, paid people to come in and create a disturbance. So at what Cambridge was at the, at the, uh, in the Washington, Berlin area, was almost nightly on the news. So I guess once Ann Arnold Hedgeman insisted on women being in there, that had to be, you know, one of the people. And I understand there was a whole argument whether I was SNCC or NAACP. We had long given up NAACP in that town for uh, because they were ineffective. So that's how. Then, then I was a coordinator for the Eastern Shore to get the buses and people to go to the march. And about two weeks before the march, they called and asked, and I would have two minutes to speak, and please dress up. Don't wear. Uh, dung jeans now, but dungarees. So I went out and found a denim skirt and went. So they may have been a mul multiple things in terms of them taking the mic away because, um, one, we weren't the MLK model as we developed, and we were not doing once a year demo of speeches. 
it was a daily kind of thing for almost a year and a half. We were just showing a picture of you, a famous picture of you uh, pushing the um, it right next to the bayonet of uh, the national. Oh yes, the, they were trying to. He was going to stab me, so I had to push it. But anyhow. And they came because we, we weren't supposed to be demonstrating. We were out there to demonstrate, and we had been at a little shoeshine shop with General Gelston, with him trying to stop, tell us no, and we're trying to say, yes, we're going to do it, when a whole lot of—we thought they were bullets. I don't know what he thought. He may have known what it was, but it happened to be tear gas. But when we—I rushed out, and all the people were in the street. And then this guy was started coming toward me. I thought he's got to be crazy, <laughs> and and I don't I don't even know why I pushed the gun, but I know I was furious at that time. But so back to August 28th, you're asked to speak. You all go on buses to Washington. Yes, I went to the hotel. Went, we went, had hotel accommodations, and they came and got me. I and to take me to the march. I was late, but that wasn't because of me. They had to, and took me to the tent. When I got to the tent, the women were all there. They they got up after a while and said they were going to the ladies' room and would be back. So I sat and waited for them to come back. In the meantime, I was doing some interviews. But then all of a sudden, Bear Rustin popped up and said, what are you doing sitting here in the tent? And I said, I'm sitting here waiting, and explained to him that I was sitting here waiting for the women. Oh, no, he said, come go with me. So I went, he took me through the crowd uh, to the stage. And that's when— There you saw Lena, Lena Horn. Horn and Josephine Baker, which really— I was really like, the great oh, singer. wow, <laughs> yes. And they said to me— uh, they've taken your chair away. Well, it proved they had chairs for the women, I guess for everybody maybe that was named, with a banner across it. So, and asked me, you, you should raise hell. I said, uh, I thought, no, I don't have to do that. We're out in the streets and catch. So I said to them, no, I see a lawyer back there and I have a problem, so I'm going back and talk with him. And that's, that's essentially what happened. I think with Lena, and I, I can't remember exactly how this happened, but she was taking Rosa Parks around to, to European satellite stations and saying, this is the woman that started Montgomery. This is it. So when I saw her doing that, I joined her. But, I mean, this is amazing. Rosa Parks was there, but she was not asked yeah, to speak. No. Rosa Parks, who launched Dr. Martin Luther that's King. That's right. And that's what Lena Montgomery. was taking and saying, this is the woman that— <laughs> So I joined that little effort and went with them to two or three places, and then back on the stage. I don't think any of it really soaked into me until afterwards. And I must say, I probably wouldn't even have gone that far to participate. I only found out in the last two or three weeks on the <laughs> Internet that they had a separate place for separate street for the women to march from. Then when I look at the pictures, it is totally men. So, and most of whom had not been out in those streets. So your name is called to speak. Yes, they called, they called the name, and I went up. People kept saying, no, go up anyhow. And I, so I went up, so I said, hello, and I really, by that time, was so annoyed, I was going to tell them, you all just sit here until they pass that civil rights bill, even if it is a weak one. And I said, hello. So I guess they were right. And because they pulled they put, the mic from oh, you. Oh, yeah, they pulled it. But they had one of the marshals. Then they came af after. I don't think I heard da uh, Daisy Bates speak, but they came and got me um, With and Lena Horn. Horn and told us, oh, you all may get mobbed or create a mob, and so uh, uh, come on and go with me. We're going to put you in a taxi set, uh, and send you back to the hotel. So we did that, and we heard just part of Martin's speech on the radio in the taxi. But in re retrospect, I think it was because she was determined to see that Rosa Parks was recognized. And I had worn the denim skirt and hadn't dressed up properly and was a woman and a series of things. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion. Our guest is Gloria Richardson. She was on the stage at the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom when she was co-founder of the Cambridge Nonviolent Action Committee in Maryland. And she was slated to speak 
only got out the word hello before the mic was taken from her. When we come back, we'll continue the discussion of the, of the civil rights movement at the time, and also hear from Malcolm X when he recognized Gloria Richardson in his speech, his message to the grassroots. Stay with us.